Okay, so um, this work is essentially a very minor contribution of mine to what I think is a very interesting story, so I'm kind of pleased to present the story. Um, there are kind of two components to it. There are parameterized model checking problems, which in general are known to be undecidable, so that's fairly negative. And then there are concurrent pushdown systems, for which model checking is also known to be undecidable, so that's another negative thing. But um, as any sort of primary school mathematician knows, if you take two negative things, you multiply them together, you get something positive. So in this case, the positive thing is that parameterized model checking problems for concurrent pushdown systems are decidable. So if you think I've just performed some kind of sleight of hand here, then you'd be right, and the rest of the talk is to explain how this situation arises. So to begin, I will just, to make sure you all know what I've actually done, I'll just state my main theorem, and if you know the story, then you can probably fall asleep for a bit. So we're going to take two pushdown systems. So we have uh, one C and one U. So C is a pushdown system that we can think of as a controller process. And, um, and we have U that we can think of as the user process. And I'm going to put these two systems in parallel. So we're going to take one copy of C and an arbitrary number of U. So the whole point is that this number of copies is not fixed from the start. It's part of the problem to discover how many copies of U we can get away with. And then we're going to take these processes, put them in parallel, and they're going to communicate through a global store called G. So G can have many variables, but for the purpose of this talk, it will just have one. And the processes, what they can do is they can write to this store, or they can read from this store. Now, they cannot do this at the same time. They cannot check a value and then set it. So if they want to look at the value and then write to it, they have to do that in two operations. So in between those two operations, obviously, anything can happen. So that's what we mean by non-atomic. And the result is that um, if you take this problem you're, and you say, are there a number of views that we can put with the system to make sure whether a state's reachable, then we can decide that in doubly exponential time. So that's my result. And I'll go through the history of this result and why I think it's an interesting story. So we're going to begin with the parameterized model checking problem. So this says, given a schematic program P, so that's basically it's a program defined with an input N. And how, what, how this program looks depends on the input n. And we ask, is there some value of n that we can pick such that the program that's defined by this n satisfies a certain property, uh, phi in this case? And it was shown by Apton-Cosen in 1986 that this problem is undecidable. And that even holds true even if each particular pn is finite state. And the reason this is undecidable is because, well, it's for very kind of simple reasons, is that if you take a Turing machine, you say that your nth program is the finite state machine that runs the Turing machine for n steps. So in n steps, you can only use n cells of your tape, so you have a finite state machine. And of course, when n becomes a parameter, and you say, Do there, does there exist an n, what you're saying is, does there exist an n such that my machine terminates in n steps? You're solving the whole team problem, so immediately you're undecidable. So, and they do this for parallel results for systems, but it's very simply parallel in that you put lots of systems together, but you only care about one of them. So this is a very pathological result. It's very unlikely that you're going to define your program to be run a Turing machine for n steps. So we start to say, what about more natural instances of this problem? So the first result on this that I know of is by Suzuki in 1988. And what he does is he considers ring networks with n nodes on the ring. So all of the nodes are identical, and they're just in a ring. So they can talk to the neighbor on the left, and they can talk to the neighbor on the right. They store some finite information themselves, and they have a token they pass around. So this is a much more natural problem, but unfortunately, we're still undecidable. And the reason this is is because thinking about Turing machines again, if we're going to use n cells in our tape, we have a network with n nodes, where each node is responsible for playing the part of a single cell in the tape. So what it does is it stores the value of the cell, and the read-write head is contained by one of the cells, and if it wants to move the head to the right, it passes it to its right neighbor. If it wants to move it to the left, it moves it to its left neighbor. So they can simulate a Turing machine by passing this uh, control head around as, it, as they like. And obviously we say, is there some size such that blah, 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 and we get undecidability. So now we're still undecidable, so we have to think about why is this problem being undecidable. So in this case, we've got a ring communication structure. 
we definitely know the whole simulation works because if we want to move the Turing machine head to the left, we talk to our left neighbor. And if we want to move it to our right, we talk to our right neighbor. So it very much depends on being able to talk to your left and talk to your right. So the first decidable results in this area basically said, well, let's break this whole system and have the situation where we don't know who we're talking to anymore. So if we want to talk to our left neighbor, we can try, we can send a message to our left, but we've no guarantee that it will actually go to the left. It could go to the right. It could go miles away over there. And if we break this kind of idea, so if you want to communicate, you have to communicate with some node in the network, not with a particular node, then you get decidability. So this is a result by uh, German and Sisler in 1987. And they say for a finite, state, a finite state system C and a finite state system U, just as I said at the start, where you put C, the controller, in parallel with any number of U's, then we have decidability. And this result is by Petrinets. So essentially, because U is finite state, a Petrinet can be thought of as a vector addition system where we have a number of counters, C1 to Cm. So because U is finite state, so we can have a counter for each state of the system that counts how many processes we have in that state. And if we want to move a process from state 1 to state 2, we decrement the first counter, increment the second counter. It's very easy, and using Petronet reachability, we get a decidable system. So things are looking good. So how can we start to generalize this? So I'm interested in push-down systems. As you Peter described in the last talk, they are very interesting systems. So we can start to think about this whole network where we've got this kind of confused communication structure, a controller process and some user processes. And we say, well, we know when they're both finite state, then we have a good situation. But what happens if we let some of these be push-down systems? So, um, because we're playing with undecidability, I just remind you why pushdown systems are undecidable. So this is how I draw a pushdown system. We have our control state, which was P and Q in the last talk, but I've just one, two, three here. And then we have stacks, A, B, A on top of B. We can push onto the stack and we can pop from the stack and behave like a pushdown. And as I said at the beginning, we have two of these machines communicating. We get undecidability very quickly. So the reason this is the case, or one proof of this, there are many, it's because we can use these two, two systems to play the part of a Turing machine tape. So for a tape, we have the part to the left of the set, to the left of the read-write head, and we have the, set, the tape to the right. So we have our two push-down systems, and the first one in its stack is going to store the tape to the right, and the second one in its stack is going to store the tape to the left. And if, it, if this guy wants to move its read-write head to cell 4, then that will be simulated just by transferring cell 4 to the other stack. And if it wants to move it back, it does the opposite operation. So it doesn't take much for two pushdown systems to be able to play the part of a Turing machine and ruin our whole model checking problems. So let's go back to this general framework where we have C's and U's. If we have the case where these U's might be a pushdown system and we communicate just by message passing left and right, then we only need a very simple controller that says, I'm going to let one process in the cloud be the left and another process in the cloud be the right, so it's going to say only allow one process to be the left and one to be the right, and all of the other processes just get stuck doing nothing. So in our cloud of millions of pushdown systems, only two of them are actually doing anything. So when these two processes talk, they know they're talking to each other, and they can quite happily simulate a Turing machine. So if you have this kind of parallel situation and a very simple controller, we're still undecidable. So as Vinit Kalon, who had a paper in Lix uh, four years ago now, I guess, we had to that if we get rid of this controller, then we're decidable. So we have a number of pushdown systems U, an arbitrary number in parallel, communicating by message passing, and we're decidable. And uh, the reason this is is because if we want to try and do a Turing machine, then the, there's no controller, so the processors have to guess themselves whether they're going to be left and right. So 20 processors might decide they're on the left, 20 processors might decide they're on the right, and they'll start trying to talk to each other, but because they cannot single out who they're talking to, they're just making a confused mess. So they carry on talking, and in fact, by a very simple reachability algorithm, he proved decidability. So there's one sort of key sort of property of his proof that I would like to highlight, and this is that what he does is he observes that as soon as one pushdown system has been capable of performing a single action, then that action can occur as many times as we like. It can happen an arbitrary number of times. And the reason this is the case is because um, suppose some collection of processes together had been able to work together to produce an A action, say. Then what we can do is we can take that collection of processes 
And because we're free to choose as big an n as we need, we can replicate that collection of processes an arbitrary number of times. So as soon as that action happens once, it can happen as many times as we like. So he does a kind of fixed point operation saying, what actions can be formed with no communication? And then, given that those actions can happen, what other actions can happen? And he does a fixed point until he knows everything that can happen in the system. So this is a very nice result. So I was interested in, I started to thought, how can I just sort of generalize it a bit more? So in particular, the system loses the controller. So I thought, well, let's try and put the controller back. Secondly, the communication is by uh, message passing. And I generally think about things in terms of global stores, so I thought, let's try and put a global store in here too. So at the moment, if we have a situation with a controller and our sure of users talking via a global store, then we're still undecidable. And this is because in the global store, we can put some locks. So if somebody wants to play the left tape, they set the lock to say, right, nobody else can play the left, and similarly for the right. So this is why I have this non-atomic restriction. So somebody can read from the state, they can look at the lock, and see what it is, or they can set the lock, but they can't do a check and set action atomically. So they can try and be the only left process, but in between reading and writing, another 20 processes may also try and be the left. So in the case where this uh, read-write is non-atomic, then we have decidability again in doubly exponential time. Okay, so, so I have some time, so I'll repeat the theorem again, and I'll give you a flavor of how the proof works. So the th theorem again, in doubly exponential time, we can solve this reachability problem. So we begin with Colon's observation that as soon as something happened once, it can happen an arbitrary number of times. So in this case, we can't quite be so, uh, oh no, we can be. It's a bit, little bit more difficult because what the control process does can only happen once really, because the control process, we can't replicate it. So we have to be a bit more careful about what happens. But the user process as soon as a user can do something, it can do it as many times as we like. So another observation is that we can essentially make each sort of write to the global store be the responsibility of a single process. And that's because in a run, say, of length m, they're gonna, they could be up to m writes to the store. So if we want to um, replicate this run where, where each process only writes something meaningful once, then we just have a whole collection of processes for each write. We can just duplicate them as many times as we like. So I have what I call a read language in a paper, which is this sort of act, the things that have to happen to the global store in order for a process to do a particular write that we want it to do. So in this case, we might have to read an A, read a B, write a C, read a D, write an E, in order to eventually write this G, which is what we're actually interested in. So we begin with this, and we start making some abstractions to it. So first of all, I said that this process is only really responsible for this right at the end. So these rights in the middle, we can kind of abstract them a bit and just replace them by hash actions. So this hash action generally corresponds to writing something to the store, but something that will not be used by any of the processes. So this is going to be kind of a clearing of the store, writing an empty value to the store. So this alteration is sound because if you destroyed the store, you're only blocking things from happening. And it's complete because if this particular write happens to be important, we just create another set of processes that are responsible for that particular write. So it's both sound and complete to do. The next observation is that these are just what the process sees happens to the store. The process can close its eyes whenever it likes and not look at the store at all. So in between any of these actions, anything could happen. So it could be that between this, reading this A and reading this B, then 20 writes occurred to the store. We just didn't pay attention. Similarly, we could decide at any point between here to destroy the value of the store with a hash and just rely on another process to erase our nasty mess that we just made. So what we have here is a context-free language defined by the Pushtan system U, and we've taken the upwards closure of it. We can say, as long as this is a subword word and anything else happens in between, then we're okay. So we've taken the upwards closure, and due to a result by um, Atigatel in 2008, the upwards closure of a context-free language is regular. So that's immediately a nice situation. We've gone from having lots of pushdown systems in parallel to having one pushdown system in parallel with some regular systems. So then what we do is we do a kind of product construction utilizing this observation at the top, and we play around with the runs and prove that it all works out fine, and we essentially just have to model check a pushdown system. The pushdown system is of doubly exponential size because building this upwards closure is quite an expensive operation. 
So I'd just like to say a few words on the upwards closure. So the kind of main proof I've done with, but I just want to say how I did it. So the result by Attic et al, I didn't actually know when I wrote the paper, and it was pointed out by a reviewer. So I actually did a different proof that the upwards closure is regular. And I kind of like it, so I thought I'd mention it. So there's a result by Aaron Freud and Rosenberg in 1985, which is, I think, only cited three times according to Google, which I think is a shame, because it's kind of a nice result, and the paper is very nice to read. So what they say is that they talk about strong iterative pairs of a context-free language. And what they mean by strong iterative pair are words u, x, v, y, and w, such that whenever it is the case that u, x to the n, v, y to the n, w is in your language for every n, it must also be the case that you can break this connection between x to the n and y to the n and say x to the n and y to the n. So if that's the case, then you're regular. So the reason you can think about this, if you know the pumping lemma, you know stuff like this. So somehow the essence of a context-free language is that these x's and these y's can be connected together to occur the same number of times. So if it's the case that this connection is not actually true, we could have y as many times as we like, irrespective of how many times we have x, then we in fact have a regular language. So they prove that when these strong iterative pairs are all like this, then we have a regular language. And it's quite a nice paper. And their proof wasn't constructive, so I had to do a bit of work just to make sure that we could actually build our automaton. OK, so uh, time to conclude. So again, to repeat, we have a parameterized reach multi problem where we have a control process, and an arbitrary review user processes. Each of these are push down systems. They communicate via a global store, but they cannot interact with the store atomically. Then we have reachability. And there are a number of things that I'd like to kind of continue from this work. So um, first of all, the reason I actually thought of this in the first place was due to weak memory models. So if you don't know about weak memory models, they kind of take what processes actually do rather than what we'd like them to do. So in theory, we always think of concurrent processes as, as being like an interleaving of the processes. But what processes do is they start doing caching and weird things. So when you try and construct what actually happened on your processor, it's not necessarily, necessarily an interleaving anymore. So this made me think of these parameterized problems where the communication's not quite as reliable as you'd like it to be. Unfortunately, it turns out that this problem is even harder than normal pushdown model checking, so there's still some work to be done. Another area is the complexity. So I've given a doubly exponential algorithm, but in fact, I can only prove that it's NP-complete. And this is um, not very good. It's a bit of a gap. But there are kind of questions. So I'm kind of, it seems like a weak system, but you can do some nasty things. So I think that this upwards closure technique, at least my proof technique, has to be doubly exponential. I mean, you can get an exponential low bound easily because you can write a pushdown system that produces a string exponentially long. So a regular automaton must be exponentially sized. I think Attic et al. might have got uh, 2x lower bound for the model checking they were thinking about. So maybe that implies that their upwards closure should also be double exponential. But somehow, because you can't really have much control with a global store, then maybe it should only be MP, but I can't think of an MP algorithm. There's also some applications to ping pong protocols. So Esparza has a paper where he shows that these ping pong protocols are essentially systems where as soon as an action happens once, it can happen an arbitrary number of times, but they do not have this control process in their model. So I'm wondering whether by adding this control process, we can extend their research in some way. OK, I think that's everything. Yeah, great. So that's everything. So thank you very much for your attention.